The Federal Reserve System, to most people, seems like it is a agency of the federal government. That's what I thought it was when I first started to research this topic. But it turns out that it's nothing of the kind. The Federal Reserve is a hybrid organization. It's a partnership between the federal government and the private banks. When you look at it deeper than that, its essence is neither as a government agency or a private company. In reality, it is a cartel. monarchy. Though many reasons are cited for the revolution, one in particular sticks out as the prime cause, that King George III of England outlawed the interest-free, independent currency the colonies were producing and using for themselves, in turn forcing them to borrow money from the Central Bank of England at interest, immediately putting the colonies into debt. And as Benjamin Franklin later wrote, the refusal of King George III to allow the colonies to operate an honest money system which freed the ordinary man from the clutches of the money manipulators was probably the prime cause of the revolution. In 1783, America won its independence from England. However, its battle against the central bank concept and the corrupt, greed-filled men associated with it had just begun. So what is a central bank? A central bank is an institution that produces the currency of an entire nation. Based on historical precedent, two specific powers are inherent in central banking practice. The control of interest rates and the control of the money supply or inflation. The central bank does not simply supply a government's economy with money, it loans it to them at interest. Then through the use of increasing and decreasing the supply of money, the central bank regulates the value of the currency being issued. It is critical to understand that the entire structure of this system can only produce one thing in the long run. Debt. It doesn't take a lot of ingenuity to figure this scam out. For every single dollar produced by the central bank is loaned at interest. That means every single dollar produced is actually the dollar plus a certain percent of debt based on that dollar. And since the central bank has the monopoly over the production of the currency for the entire country, and they loan each dollar out with immediate debt attached to it, where does the money to pay for the debt come from? It can only come from the central bank again, which means the central bank has to perpetually increase its money supply to temporarily cover the outstanding debt created, which in turn, since that new money is loaned out at interest as well, creates even more debt. The end result of this system without fail is slavery, for it is impossible for the government and thus the public to ever come out of the self-generating debt. The founding fathers of this country were well aware of this. By the early 20th century, the U.S. had already implemented and removed a few central banking systems, which were swindled into place by ruthless banking interests. At this time, the dominant families in the banking and business world were the Rockefellers, the Morgans, the Warburgs, the Rothschilds. And in the early 1900s, they sought to push, once again, legislation to create another central bank. However, they knew the government and public were very weary of such an institution, so they needed to create an incident to affect public opinion. So, J.P. Morgan, publicly considered a financial luminary at the time, exploited his mass influence by publishing rumors that a prominent bank in New York was insolvent or bankrupt. Morgan knew this would cause mass hysteria, which would affect other banks as well. And it did. The public, in fear of losing their deposits, immediately began mass withdrawals. 
Consequently, the banks were forced to call in their loans, causing the recipients to sell their property, and thus a spiral of bankruptcies, repossessions, and turmoil emerged. Putting the pieces together a few years later, Frederick Allen of Life magazine wrote, The Morgan interests took advantage to precipitate the panic, guiding it shrewdly as it progressed. Unaware of the fraud, the panic of 1907 led to a congressional investigation headed by Senator Nelson Aldrich, who had intimate ties to the banking cartels and later became part of the Rockefeller family through marriage. The commission, led by Aldrich, recommended a central bank should be implemented so a panic like 1907 could never happen again. This was the spark the international bankers needed to initiate their plan. In 1910, a secret meeting was held at a J.P. Morgan estate on Jekyll Island off the coast of Georgia. It was there that the central banking bill called the Federal Reserve Act was written. This legislation was written by bankers, not lawmakers. This meeting was so secretive, so concealed from government and public knowledge, that the ten or so figures who attended were told they could only use their first names in addressing each other. After this bill was constructed, it was then handed over to their political frontman, Senator Nelson Aldrich, to push through Congress. And in 1913, with heavy political sponsorship by the bankers, Woodrow Wilson became president, having already agreed to sign the Federal Reserve Act in exchange for campaign support. And two days before Christmas, when most of Congress was at home with their families, the Federal Reserve Act was voted in, and Wilson in turn made it law. Years later, Woodrow Wilson wrote, in regret. Congressman Lewis McFadden also expressed the truth after the passage of the bill. A world banking system was being set up here, a super state controlled by international bankers acting together to enslave the world for their own pleasure. The Fed has usurped the government. 